And it's, it's not only what you do, but it's how you do things and how you inspire and get other people involved. And I think that feeling was, became very strong in, in Hawaii during my time. And that became, I think, my political strength. He campaigned as quiet but effective. And though he hadn't envisioned a career in politics, George Ariyoshi never lost an election. Hawaii's longest serving governor reflects on the legacy of his 13 years in high office and what he's been doing in the quarter century since he retired from government service. That's next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako and welcome to Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. George Ariyoshi was the youngest Democrat elected to Hawaii's territorial legislature in the Democratic Revolution of 1954. And 20 years later, he would become the first governor in America who was not white. The son of Japanese immigrants, Ariyoshi attended McKinley High School during World War II, served in the military intelligence service after the war, and graduated from the University of Michigan Law School. He was building his law practice when he met Democratic Party leader and future governor John Burns, who encouraged him to run for office in 54. Five years later, as a member of the state Senate in the first year of statehood, Ariyoshi was navigating the tricky path of pursuing his legislative goals while playing the high stakes game of politics. When Republican Governor William Quinn nominated Republican Samuel P. King to become a judge, Ariyoshi faced a conflict between his personal convictions and party loyalty. The Republicans controlled the Senate during the time I was out there. Sam King's name came down for confirmation. And we had, at that time, 14 Republicans and 11 Democrats. But Sam King didn't have two Republicans, so he only had 12 Republican votes. And our Democrats got together and said, if you can hold a firm on this, we can defeat the nomination. And I listened to all of that, and I finally said, wait now, let's, why, what kind of judge would he make? And to oh, he would be a very fine judge, but that's not the question. I said, but it is, we're talking about confirmation of the judge. And they told me that, oh, they have a chance to embarrass the administration. Now this is political, they say. And I listened to that and I said, wait, I want to say something now. You remember 1954 when it got started? That's only four or five years ago. I got involved because I wanted fairness in this community. I wanted everybody to be treated fairly, advanced on the basis of their ability. You tell me you're going to make a fine judge. Why can't, why are we hold, going to hold back? And I told them that it was important that in order to be fair, you gotta be fair not just to your friends, you gotta be fair to those who may not be your friends. And that's the measure of your, your fairness. And they told me that they couldn't see it uh, that way and we had to go out and be together as a group and I told them, I'm sorry, I'm going out there and I'm gonna publicly say that I'm gonna support Sam Kings. I called him and he was so overjoyed, he told me, oh, now, that's a vote I needed to get confirmed, and I can sleep well tonight. And that's, ha that's what happened? Yes. And yet, when you were governor, I, I don't know how many times you heard this, uh, this expression, the machine, you know, the uh -huh. democratic machine under uh -huh. Governor Ariyoshi <laughs> controlling people. I mean, it didn't sound like uh, George would stand <laughs> up alone. Uh -huh. How did you feel about that, and was there any truth to it? No. I thought no truth to it because I was very open. You take, for example, the state plans. I didn't want it to be my plan, and I wanted to involve people. And I wanted I brought together so many people in every functional plan and had let it become their plan. I think it's an indication of my willingness to look at things that happen in the community and involve people. The super fair is one of those things uh, that I became very concerned about because they were trying to shortcut the process, and I think that the people who were in power at that time were willing to take those shortcuts. But I think if you had gone through the process and everybody talk about, oh, how important it is and why we need to get this, 
there would have been greater support for an understanding of the need for a ferry and as a result make it happen. I think it's true in our planning effort. Every functional plan, I had between 200 to 400 people involved and they were happy to be involved because now they could talk about and participate in how they wanted to see things happen in our community. So they all went to the legislature. I never had to lobby. They went to the legislature and said, this is not Ariosha's plan. This is our plan. It's our ideas. It's what we think is important and necessary to get where we want to be. And I try to select people based upon their differences, different communities they come from, different uh, occupational background, different cultural background. And I used to take part in the sharing ceremonies and tell them that you are serving on a board and you'll find a great deal of diversity. And this is by design because we don't believe that it should be control of one or two individuals moving in a certain direction. Everybody should participate and everybody should have a voice in what happens. And I, my feeling was you put it all on the table and then you have a chance to select the best of the ideas rather than one person indicating the direction and you have to go. That was my whole process. Everything that I did when I was governor uh, fell along that line. When I had my budget uh, problems at the very beginning, finance, I called the unions, I called the public employees. And this turned out to be the first economic recession That's right. since statehood. That's right. And I called them together and I told them that I didn't want to fire anybody. I didn't want to make any uh, pay cuts. And I've thought about a way to do that, but I need help. And I explained to them that I was not going to fill positions that became vacant and that I wanted, however, those who remain to pick up what, what, what had been done before. So I told them if five people are working now and one position becomes vacant, I want the four to do not four doing, I want the four to do what five were doing. They all agreed. And I felt that I had a very heavy burden beyond that which would be faced by an average governor, just wanted to do the best for the community. You see, when I became governor in 1974, it was 15 years after Hawaii had become a state. And I wanted to know what happened during that 15-year period, so I looked at it very carefully. And one of the things that really struck me was the population growth, where we had grown about 200% a year, national rate about 8 tenths of 1%. So we were growing three times as fast as the uh, population growth elsewhere. And I became very concerned about the need for us to think about Hawaii. What kind of place is it going to be? How do we get there? What kind of things must we be concerned about in order for us to get off in the wrong kind of directions? I had about seven young people who were in my office working, uh, when I was governor who handled the key functions of my office. And some of them were still at the university. And I learned also about their commitment about wanting to live in the community. And I felt very strongly about what they wanted to do, not as in the political arena, but they can become anything they want, but they don't forget that there is a commitment onto, to the community. And that has been a very important part of my life now. I put together a booklet, uh, Hawaii's 50th anniversary, and I talked about 50 years of Hawaii statehood, but I especially spent time talking about the next 50 years and I did that to give to, to challenge the young people in our community. And I had one of those pamphlets given to every high school or senior. And I was invited many, many times to go to high school to speak to them. And every time I went, I came away feeling so good about our young people. I found them very concerned about the future. They started talking about jobs, they talked about economy, about housing. I learned a lot from young people, and they've played a very important role in shaping my life. Uh, and it's, it's not only what you do, but it's how you do things and how you inspire and get other people involved. And I think that feeling was, became very strong in, in Hawaii during my time. And that became, I think, my political strength. And my campaign manager was Bob Oshiro. And after my first election, I had to sit with him. I had to tell him why I'm going to run for office again, why I'm going up for re-election. What have I done, and what are my plans? What's my vision for the future? He made you uh, apply for the job all over That's again right. with him. That's right. Uh-huh. 
and, and he was a very uh, good campaign manager, but he was also a real visionary. Family, friends, and colleagues influenced George Ariyoshi's political approach over the years, but none more than his mentor, John Burns. In 1970, Burns convinced Ariyoshi to be his running mate when he ran for his third term as governor. They won that election, and when Burns became too ill to serve in late 1973, Lieutenant Governor Ariyoshi stepped into the governor's job. The following year, he won his first of three elections for Hawaii's chief executive. By then, Burns had helped instill in Ariyoshi the confidence to stand firm for his beliefs while bridging differences and building consensus to overcome opposition. Well, I think Jack Burns played a very significant, significant role in development of my uh, idea and my style. But Burns is feeling that the situation was changing that he represented older people in the community, but he felt the young people in the community might have a different point of view. So when I got elected, he told me that you and I are different people. I'm Caucasian, you're Japanese. I was born in Montana, you're born in Hawaii. You grew went to school here, I went to school elsewhere. You know, I was an army brat, I traveled wherever my parents went, but you have roots here in Hawaii, and as a result, you're thinking, got to be different from mine. And please feel free to do what you feel you have to do. Say what you have to say. And if you disagree with me and you have to disagree, that's okay with me too. I really appreciated that part about Jack Burns when he told me that. You know, for example, in 1976, the state health department was having a great deal of problems with the plantations, sugar plantations that they're taking Bogast, that's the sugarcane waste, mm -hmm. and they just bulldoze it into the ocean. And EPA and the state health, health department want them to stop that. And the plantation people said, see, bro, we're going to stop, and we we're going to take that into bulldozing. We're going to burn that, and we're going to generate electricity. But it's going to take us 17 months to create that. The health department said, no, we give you six months only. So they came to me, and I talked to Governor Burns about it. He told me, what do you think? I said, you know, they're going to stop bulldozing in 17 months, but they can't stop now. They're going to create the system that's going to be taken care, and they're going to create one third of the electricity on the island of Hawaii when they finish this. And I think it's a good thing for them to do this. You will need to suffer the consequence? Uh, yep. So I did that. And then, one of the attorney generals assigned to the health department went to the EPA where they were having a meeting and they complained about George Ariyoshi caved into the sugar plantation groups mm -hmm. and went along with pol keeping this pollution going. And I went to a meeting and I told them what was happening, what the why I was doing this. And they kind of went along with me. And when I saw Governor Burns after that, he told me, I just wanted you to witness and feel what was going to happen. He said, I knew this was going to happen. I knew you were going to be criticized, but I didn't want you to have, go through the experience of hearing this. And he told me, I knew you were going to stand up for it and be able to do, work it out. What's the toughest thing you've ever been through professionally and also the, the uh, biggest personal challenge you've had in your life? I think that when I was faced with the Marilyn Landau, and that's a law that would have given options to purchase to leaseholders, future leaseholders, but would not have existing leaseholders. And I was sold on reform. I wanted the option to be uh, right to purchase. But I didn't want it to hurt people in the process. I had unions come sit before me and tell me that if I didn't go along, they were going to be taking it up from me. I was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee at that time, and I was told that if I didn't go along, I would lose my chairmanship, and I took that as an opportunity to tell people, you know, you have a point of view, I respect you for that. And I'm not telling you I'm right and you're wrong, but you've got to respect my right, or the right of any person who feels very strongly that something is there and they have to vote in a certain kind of way. And I think that was a very difficult period for me, but it was a very enlightening period because people began to understand that that's what we had to do 
we have to stand up for what we believe to be right and be unafraid to take that, take that position. I had no people tell me we were against you because we didn't understand the bill. But in fact, the leaseholders told me, you protected us. And then there were those who came to me and told me that we disagree with you, but we admire your willingness to come to us and talk about it. And the other very important principle, which is very ethical today, the party platform. And there were some of them saying to me, oh, this is a party platform, land reform, and you've got to go along with it. And my feeling was the party platform is very vague. We have all kinds of feelings of people, different point of views in the party. And that we cannot expect every person to do everything that the party platform says. We've got to make leeway allowances for people to have differences. So may I ask you, what was your most daunting personal challenge? See, I made a decision before I left the office that I was not going to do anything that affected uh, the work that I did as governor. In other words, any state policy I was not going to get involved in for compensation. And I have stuck to that policy. When they first asked me, to talk to me about it when I was governor, one of the really big things that was available was to become trustee of Bishop Estate. And very early I took, took, the, posi took the position. I appointed those people who are going to make the judge judgment and I will not go to them and ask them to have them do something for me. So I stayed away from that and I was asked that the day before I left the office what my policy for whether it's changed or not because I was leaving the office. No same thing, same reasons apply. I went one first step further. I told him if the position were offered to me, I would decline to accept it. And I think drawing the very clear demarcation between the kind of things that I want to get involved in and the kind that I did not want to get involved in, to me became very important. What is that like? I mean, everyone's been criticized by somebody, but I um, mean, very few people get criticized at the level a governor gets criticized by with a, uh, with a statewide uh, audience watching and thinking and s expressing opinions. What's it like living with that? I felt every person have their own point of view. No matter what you try to do, it's not going to be the same way it's going to apply to every person. A person in Wai like Kahala may be impacted a different kind of way from a person in I. I understood that, so I felt people had a right to say what they wanted to do about the policies. I embraced the, the differences, and I brought them in, and I told them, hey, tell us more about why what we're doing is not the right thing. But you hear a lot of personal stuff, yeah. too. How's that? Yeah. I, this was part of the game. I accepted that, and I was not uh, too concerned. He left office more than a quarter century ago, and George R. Yoshi does not live in the past. In fact, he's consumed with thinking about Hawaii's future, preserving our natural resources and cultural heritage, and developing our economy for coming generations. I think we need to look at diversify our economy, and people are trying to do that now. But I think maybe there has to be someone who can kind of point out what kind of things are necessary to be considered in order to get there. And to me, in the health field, Hawaii can become the real leader in so many things in the health field, and the technology that comes along with making it possible. And then I think we need to have the university become very much involved and developing some of the technology. You know, for example, the person who wants to start something here, they don't know what to start. But shouldn't the university be able to point out what areas are very vital areas in which they can think can become very successful? And all that brain power of the university, I think we need to be let them know that we appreciate those kind of things that they can do to help make economy future, Hawaii's future but they also have the right to participate in the success that come from that. And in the past, I think we've had kind of a feeling that, oh, the people at the university get paid by us, all R&D belongs to us, and that they should not benefit from that. I think that benefit becomes a two-way street. I was very strongly for aerospace because in Hawaii, we look for technology, and this aerospace is going to be something that's going to be very big and important to 
but Hawaii must not lose the opportunity to be involved. And we have Barking Sands in Kauai, we have the telescope that nobody else has. We have astronauts that are trained on Hawaii, but no, no, no other state can say that. The private sector coming to me and talking about, oh, how they, get, they can be involved in this uh, process. So I have gone to the legislature, I've gone to the government, and to try to get them informed about what the process is. When we first started that, very few people understood. But today, the greatest supporters of aerospace are those who are in the legislature. And so, but I didn't do that because of compensation. I did it because my very strong feelings about Hawaii. I'm very much against, for example, the selling the property out in Haleiwa, that part of the park land, three acres or so, right. that they're going to not, that they can't develop. And they should remain a part of it. They should not sell that kind of property. That property does not belong to us now for us to sell and to get the user money. It's there for the people in the future of Hawaii. One of George Ariyoshi's priorities since his years as governor has been the East-West Center. And in 2012, the center honored him with its prestigious Asia-Pacific Community Building Award. The center was proposed in 1959 by John Burns, who was then Hawaii's territorial delegate to Congress, and by then U.S. Senator Lyndon Johnson. In 1975, Governor Ariyoshi advanced and ultimately signed a law that gave the East-West Center autonomy from the University of Hawaii. First, though, he had to persuade the U.S. State Department. And at first, it was very difficult for them to understand that. And they thought I was accusing them of being very uh, biased in how the center was operating. I said, no, no, I'm not expecting that bias. What I'm saying is that I want the perception of control becoming eliminated also. And when we talked about it, finally agreed. I told them I want to incorporate in the Hawaii laws. And that's what they agreed to. And then I wanted board of directors to be controlled, appointed five by the State Department, five by the governor. But I wanted five independent people appointed by the 10th. And they all agreed to that. And that's what it become. So when I hear today people talking about, oh, the center is controlled, that's not the situation. The center has a mission. The mission is to get people east and west together so that they can get to understand each other. And the center has never dictated how policies get done. We don't tell people come to Hawaii and this is a policy of the United States. This is a policy they ought to be. We leave it up to them to talk about them amongst themselves. And they can say, oh, this is how we see things, some other things, some other things, you know. And they come together. They begin to understand each other. We have a journalist program also. You know, when you think about a person who writes, that person reaches a lot of people. So what we try to do was to bring the journalists together and they have them go off to Asia and begin to talk and listen to people who have different points of views. And they begin to understand what is happening in different parts of Asia. And now, they don't write like they used to, where they're biased. They write with an understanding of how things are out there in Asia. And to me, it's a very important role of the center also. When you were governor, you, you had to learn a lot of protocol because you made state trips. What's the most interesting protocol you learned in dealing with somebody from a foreign country? I don't know what country, but any. Respect for them. And you know, after I left the governor's office, when I was there, I had started PPDC, Pacific Basin Development Council, a council made up of four governors, one American government, three territorial governors. We got together and tried to talk about the things that were important. And very often it was very critical of the United States and the Interior Department. And we were able to talk about, oh, how do we get around this problem? And by doing that, I was able to communicate with the State Department people, the Interior Department people. I was able to talk to our senators and our representative about what had to be done to help them. And that became very important. Leaders of, of uh, Samoa and Tonga and Federal State of Micronesia, I used to get them together. And we formed at East West Center a Pacific Island Development Group. Of. And when I became pro uh, chairman of the board in the organization chart, I wanted to be sure that that block was not below the president, but it was aligned at the level of the president, so that they could uh, feel that you know, they were important being acknowledged. 
But the regarding the earth, the small countries, and they feel that they are ignored and they're not given the special attention that they require. And I think that's what we need to remember, that we need to, no matter how powerful the country we are, when we talk to somebody else, some other country, we need to acknowledge that they are the heads of the country and that we have to be very courteous, courteous with and treating with them, dealing with them. And you know, for example, when I went to Thailand, my first trip to Thailand after I, we had Prem Tin Sulawesi, who was a long time serving, longest serving prime minister, he walked off the seat as I entered the room, came up to me, and he embraced me, which was kind of a rare thing to happen, a man embracing another man. And then he told me words that I still remember so clearly. Friendship is not about how long you know a person. Friendship is about how you feel towards a person. And he said, I consider you my friend. And I feel very strongly about mutual feelings about each other. And so the boy from Kalihi's political career lasted more than three decades, from the democratic revolution of the mid-1950s through an unprecedented 13-plus years as governor. At the time of this conversation in 2012, Ariyoshi is 86 years old and continues to work in downtown Honolulu as a business consultant. He travels internationally to build diplomatic and cultural connections between Hawaii and our Asia-Pacific neighbors. But Ariyoshi's favorite times are spent with his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Despite his years of experience, Governor Ariyoshi says he learns from people who are far too young to recall his years in power. He values the time he spends talking with high school students and says they give him great hope for Hawaii's future. Thank you, George Ariyoshi, for sharing your long story short. And thank you for watching and supporting PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. If you feel that a person is against something they want to do and you push them off on the side, that person will continue to be strongly against what you want to do. But if you bring them in and you ask the question, tell me why you're against this, what, what's your feeling? You begin to understand why people are opposed to certain things you want to do. You find out that maybe what, you have, what you're trying to do is not good enough, that you've got to make some modification, accommodate some differences that may exist out there. That's one thing that could happen. The other thing that could happen is that maybe you feel that, oh, after going through all this, it, what I feel now, what I want to do is so important and we're right and we've got to stick by our guns and we've got to do this and then ask people to come and join in that effort.